Wow, it's exciting to be here. And actually, I think that the, the, drum, the drum show that we just had really lends itself very well because when I was invited by Farhan to participate in today's presentation, I immediately kind of flew back as a philo philosophy enthusiast to the days when Socrates and Plato and all these people would have their discourses. And I started thinking, how is it that those discourses became transcribed and then shared through the generations? And all of a sudden it dawned on me that discourse means talk, and TED is a TED talk, and actually this is the new way and the new generation of all those discourses that happened um, through, throughout history. And we're a part of it, and it's very, very exciting to be here. Having said that, I had to struggle. I really did struggle with um, the topic that was given to me, the route to social innovation. Um, I struggled with it because I kept soul-searching, and I wanted to push beyond my own comfort zone to see what truths did I discover along my own personal journey. And the word truth kept popping up, popping up, and I said, oh my goodness, you know, this is the philosopher's dilemma. They are always challenged with the word truth and what it means to them. And at that point, I thought, well, maybe I should talk about what I think is true. Um, and I started with a definition. And I love, you know, the old discourses that Socrates and Plato was always on, on democracy, on revolution, on truth. So on truth, I found this wonderful um, quote, actually, from a German philosopher, Arthur Schopenhauer. And I can't pretend to know a lot about his work, but I did find something that resonated with me, which was the three phases um, that a truth, the three stages that a truth passes through. He said, first, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. And third, it is accepted as self-evident. And it dawned on me, in fact, that the social innovator's journey is precisely those three phases. And those three phases, I find, maybe not everybody agrees, but I find that kind of knowing what's ahead of you or knowing what to anticipate actually enables you and empowers you to be able to cope with some of the things that social innovators are going are gonna to face along their journey. Um, by the end of my 10-minute presentation, actually I have 12 minutes and 51 seconds, I can see it here, um, I want to actually be able to convince you that being ridiculed as maybe crazy, a little crazy, is actually a good thing. So passing from truth to on social innovation, my proposition today is that the truth is we can solve society's problems and unmet needs using the principles of innovation and entrepreneurship. By innovation, I'm talking about the delivery of products and services or the design of processes and campaigns and initiatives in new and in unusual ways. And by entrepreneurship, I'm talking about the really creative and efficient mobilization of resources. And when you bring innovation and entrepreneurship together, you get solutions. And I would actually take that a step further, since our topic is also about technology. Give me a single problem today, and with the people in this room, in particular this room, if we posted that problem through our Facebook, through our Twitter, through our, all of our channels, our, in our own networks, within 24 hours, we would have a set of amazing, reasonable, um, and doable solutions to the problem that we posed. And I think that it's getting faster and faster every day. We're going to revisit technology in a moment, but I'd like to illustrate a little bit what I mean about my own journey and what I've learned. So Endeavor's model, um, I'm using this as an example, Endeavor's model proposed that high-impact entrepreneurship in and of itself, if we could figure out a way to support high-impact entrepreneurship in emerging markets, that it would be the fastest and most sustainable tool for economic development. By high-impact entrepreneurship, we're talking about the entrepreneur that starts with one person, finds a partner, very quickly becomes 20 people, all of a sudden becomes 200 people, and the next thing you know, they're engaging 2,000 people. And not only are they creating jobs, but they're creating um, high-value jobs, actually, and they're also innovating with the products and services that they offer. But Endeavor thought, hmm, what is the challenge in, on, in emerging markets? Well, everybody's first point was, was very quick to point out that it was access to capital. And Endeavor said, well, we don't really have access to capital, but we do have access to people. What if we first anchored the people in a network, I think I can turn on this little light here, in a network, um, where they shared their expertise, their experience, and access to their own personal networks to work with entrepreneurs, selected entrepreneurs, um, give them support services, 
enable them, empower them, increase their probability of success. And what if we did that with just a handful of entrepreneurs and created、um, and celebrated them, and created some type of a role model effect? How would that actually serve as a catalyst to creating a movement? And what ended up happening is, and what's I think brilliant about most social innovations and social ventures, is that the original group of supporters, contributors, and beneficiaries ultimately end up switching places because it's these role models, the entrepreneurs that we've been helping, and the mentors who've gained experience working with them, that end up helping us do our other outreach programs. And the outreach programs are the things here. So we go from the individual entrepreneur and are able to, with all the things that we've learned by working with them, turn that into education, turn that into public policy campaigns, and turn that into kind of awareness building campaigns that affect the community, that affect economic development overall. And I'll say that the the roles reverse very quickly, and I think this is fascinating. When there were three incidents when I knew that we'd hit a turning point, one was when one of our board members. Um, who was one of our early founders said, "Oh my goodness, Dinam, you have these mobile entrepreneurs. You also have this digital marketing entrepreneurs, and now you're also supporting kind of youth marketing entrepreneurs.、Um, instead of me mentoring them, I would actually like to invite all of them to my holding company, which happens to be Coach Holding,、um, and I'm going to invite all of my general managers, all of my business developers, and all of my marketing people. And why don't they start ta talking to us?" About where the trends are going, and then I re realized that actually the mentors were now being men mentored. Is that if that's a word? So that was a major turning point. A second turning point was when investors came to us. In the beginning,、uh, we were trying to engage investors as supporters, and nobody was interested. The foreign investors weren't interested. There weren't really、um, enough of a、um, mobilized mass in in, the, in Turkey to be interested. And then all of a sudden, not only did we start attracting the attention of foreign investors, but the local investment community also started mobilizing. And it was when they came to us and said, "Okay, how are we going to collaborate to create pipeline of entrepreneurs? What, are, what can we do together?" That we knew we'd also made another turning point. And then, last but not least, what is also very, very exciting is when the people that we've worked with, the entrepreneurs, the mentors, and Some of the community at large, so other NGOs and other government organizations and other corporations, now all of a sudden they've come to us and they're saying, "How can we work together to keep building on the momentum that you've gained?"、Um, and that was quite a journey. But the journey wasn't easy. It wasn't easy, and in fact, the journey started way back in 2003 when I convinced exactly three people that that entrepreneurship was something that we needed to invest in in Turkey. That This tidal wave of young people,、um, which we keep talking about as, as Turkey's biggest potential, could actually become Turkey's biggest threat if we didn't figure out a way to engage them. The three people were my brother, my boyfriend at the time, and a really good dear friend.、Um, and we didn't get a lot of momentum. We went to the corporations, and they said, "We're in the middle of an economic crisis. Who's going to invest in a new initiative?" We went to media, and they said, "What are you talking about? There's an economic crisis going on. We don't understand what you're talking about." We went to universities, and they said, "Well, we teach business." We went to government organizations, and they said,、uh, "Why are you trying to start a new organization? We already have all the government policies and programs in place. We don't really need you to participate. We're already doing it." Well, we were fueled. We were fueled by conviction, and over the next three years, it took us three years to develop a critical mass of supporters. And those the supporters, it turns out that the critical mass is the, the magic number was 30, 30 people, 30 right people that really built、um, our organization were our founding board members and our original、um, mentors. And there we met with great opposition. So in the first we were ridiculed, and the second we were met with opposition because people started saying, "This time it was the entrepreneurs who actually challenged us." The entrepreneurs said, "Why are you working with holding companies?" Holding companies and corporations don't understand entrepreneurship. Huh? There's something suspicious going on there.、Um, maybe they want to take us over or learn all of our ideas. We met with opposition then too. But by 2012, entrepreneurship and its importance in any society's economic development has become self-evident. Not just in Turkey, but we can see it as a panacea for economic progress all around the world right now. Whoops. What I've learned, what I've learned along this journey, number one is that the people 
who ask, what if? In phase one, you're always asking, what if? What if we did it this way? What if we did it that way? The innovation really starts happening there. Whenever you're trying to tackle um, any type of a problem or a challenge, it's the innovator who embraces pivoting that actually keeps persevering. And by pivoting, I mean, I actually don't think that entrepreneurs or innovators, for that matter, think in terms of success and failure. I think that they t think in terms of, let's try it this way, let's try it that way, let's shift it this way, let's do this. Um, so their definitions of what, suc what success and failure is is very, very different because they're also motivated by something completely different than just a mere end result. Phase two is that good ideas are, conta are contagious. Once you've been able to attract enough, enough people, enough of the relevant people, let's say, these are the people you know that you've, uh, you've infected them with your idea. Uh, when they start asking, how about if we tried this, and they start contributing to your idea. And then last but not, not least is um, when we get to phase three, which is the co-creation phase. This is the phase that I just described um, when all of our community people started coming to us and asking us to create projects and programs together. The co-creation phase, this is when people start asking us what's next. And I think that that's um, a major lesson all along the way. I know, especially among some of the people that I've met here, that previous generations of social entrepreneurs have really had to endure an identity crisis. But I think that moving forward, um, social entrepreneurship is going to become much, much, much less incidental and much more intentional. And there are two reasons for this, and that's technology and social media. Technology, by nature and by default, and the proliferation of this new and innovative tools that we have today, um, around that, the ideation process is really, really open, and everybody's really open-minded to exploring new ways to use technology. So I think that the original resistance that entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs of the past had experienced uh, is going to be much less because we're, we're talking about technology, so everybody's kind of waiting to see how it's going to be used. The second is that technology in and of itself is a tool, and it's a tool to mobilize um, supporters, contributors, and even reach your beneficiaries faster and more effectively than ever before. So as that tool, I think that ideas are going to go through these processes and be able to test and pivot and change and modify and evolve much, much faster than we've been able to do in the past. So my advice, my advice to those of you in the audience, and I am assuming that you're here for a reason, um, is to listen to what stirs you. What stirs you in terms of inspiration? Inspiration can be something that is completely negative. It can be something that you're really, really frustrated by, and you just really need to change it. But it can also be something really positive. It can be this amazing experience or this amazing uh, epiphany that you've had that you really want to share. So listen to yourself, listen to what stirs you. But it's not enough just to be inspired. I find that you also have to have some type of a relevance to you in order to be able to, to be motivated to act. So then it's exploring what it is that you can do about it and what you can contribute. And believe me, you can contribute a lot more than you think, and everybody can contribute a lot more than they think, whether it's a housewife or um, a professional executive um, or children even um, can, can contribute in ways that maybe we're not, we're not used to seeing that we can just kind of push our own boundaries and, and get creative there. Those two things together, inspiration and relevance, is what compels people to act. And then when I'm talking about acting, I actually want to break that down too. Leadership is definitely, definitely a prerequisite component of progress. However, I think that participation is just as important as leadership. So when you're thinking about yourself as a social innovator, you don't have to do it by yourself. You can be a champion of something and be a social leader, but you can probably um, affect just as much change and be just as much of a part of a revolution by being a participant as well. And in fact, I would challenge that the person who kind of has the courage to lead comes out, is ridiculed, appears crazy. It's the second person and the third person and the fourth person that stands by that person that has to take uh, a bigger amount of, takes a little bit bigger amount of courage and, and confidence. That validation itself is really going out on a limb. And last but not least, of all the quotes, of all the quotes, so the founder of Endeavor actually is Linda Rottenberg. Um, she's, she's also the CEO. And from time to time when we're, when we're talking to entrepreneurs, she'll pull them aside and say, Have you, has anyone ever called you crazy? You know, if they haven't called you crazy, then maybe you're not thinking big enough. 
we actually like crazy. Today you're going to hear some amazing stories, and I have zero doubt that each and every one of them has been considered crazy at one point in time. And I'm sure we'll have a chance to hear their stories as well. But you're also going to see some of the amazing things that they've achieved along their journeys. And then I'm going to go back and ask you to ask yourself, what do you think is true? Is it true that social innovation can and, uh, address the, the challenges and issues of our generation? And I think that you'll find that part of that answer is you. Thank you very much.